this uh, political religion that we are talking about in Russia features uh, uh, this perception of the world where there is, you know, this holy Russia surrounded by the monsters, you know, from the dark room in the child's imagination. And they try to fight those monsters. For them, Ukraine is occupied by those monsters uh, temporarily. And essentially, they want to liberate Ukraine from, uh, from those monsters. Uh, uh, that's how they think about things, like dream about things. But in reality, what they do, they just kill people. It's very plain. Just imagine, you know, a, a, a paranoid and insane person uh, fighting, you know, those imagined monsters in a room. Uh, in his imagination, he is fighting monsters, but in effect, he's just destroying everything around him. Well, hello. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin, and this is Gospel Simplicity place where we seek to bring at least some amount of simplicity out of theological and historical complexity. And well, today that history is the history of the present. We're talking about the war in Ukraine. And I'm joined by the brilliant Dr. Cyril Havran, a Ukrainian Orthodox priest and scholar who is world renowned for his work on political orthodoxy, political religion, and how orthodoxy has been weaponized, politicized, and ideologized specifically under Putin. And he's working on a project of essentially trying to de-Putinize Orthodox religion. It's a fascinating conversation, and I think it sheds some real light on what is going on in Ukraine. Now, we make this distinction in the video, but I think it bears saying up front that when we talk about trying to make sense of what's going on in Ukraine, that in no way equates to justifying what is happening. It's merely saying that we are trying to understand what is motivating this senseless violence. When we can understand what is motivating someone, we can help better predict what they might do next and also try to see what could, what can we do in the future to prevent things like this. And well, that's the tenor of this conversation as we talk about everything from Soviet history to the kind of ideological vacuum that the Orthodox Church um, and, and its marriage with the state kind of filled after the fall of the USSR and so much more. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I hope you learn a lot. I know that I did. As with any other video that I make on this conflict in Ukraine, this war in Ukraine, let's be specific in our terminology there, this will not have YouTube ads on it, so you shouldn't have seen any at the beginning. You won't see any at the end. Instead, it will feature a fundraiser, um, which will be for food to people facing crisis in Ukraine. And if you feel so led to help them out, I would encourage you to do so by clicking that link. Thank you all for your time. And I hope this video blesses you, and here it is. Well, today I'm joined by Archimandrite Cyril Havaran. Archimandrite Cyril Havaran is a professor of ecclesiology, international relations, and ecumenism at St. Ignatius in Sweden. He is originally from Ukraine, where he first began his studies in theoretical physics before moving to the study of theology at the Theological Seminary and Academy in Kiev. He continued theological education at the National and Kapodosteran University at probably yeah. There we go. Uh, of Athens and Durham in the United Kingdom, where he defended his PhD under the supervision of Professor Father Andrew Louth. The topic of his thesis was related to the post Chalcedonian Christology. He is also the author of multiple books, including, most relevant for today, Political Orthodoxies and Ukrainian Public Theology. Dr. Havaran, thank you so much for being here today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Austin, for inviting me. Oh, it is my pleasure as well, most certainly. I wish it was under different circumstances. I, I wish we were speaking uh, of different things, but I'm very honored to have you on to talk about some of the, the pressing issues facing our world today, specifically as it relates to the Orthodox Church and uh, theology, as I know many of my viewers will be interested in. So once again, thank you, and I'll preface this with, in a lot of my interviews, I'm talking about things that I feel like I have a pretty good amount of background knowledge on. And I will readily admit that I am out of my league with this conversation. And so I'm very grateful uh, just for your, your wisdom and insight in this. And I'm excited to learn today as I hope my audience will as well. So I'd like to start with a, a brief history of Russian political religion, specifically yeah. in the post-Soviet era. I, I think this is going to be helpful to maybe try to and I have to be careful here the way I say this, when I, I say make sense of what's going on, not in the sense of any way justifying what's going right. on, but, but right, trying right. to That's 
develop a mental model maybe for for how we exactly, uh, exactly. make sense of this exactly. so um, yeah i think it's a great yeah i what? think it's a great question indeed and it's very up to the point that uh, it's important to frame uh, the events this war uh, in some kind of methodological frame if you want a kind of mental intellectual uh, um, um, a f- a frame <coughs> That may help uh, to understand what is going on because well everyone sees the pictures everyone sees uh, the horrors and uh, indeed it's impossible to make sense to to explain what why it is happening and I think there is an explanation and you are absolutely right um, uh, by indicating that there is a political religion that underpins this war and indeed we need properly to explain what is this what is political religion and uh, uh, i need to say that uh, this term has been coined in the in europe uh, in the interwar period uh, when uh, both uh, nazism and communism uh, were on rise and they were identified at the time as political religions uh, however uh, 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 different they were still uh, they belong to the same kind of category of political religions as they were defined. And essentially, political religion means that it is uh, an ideological system uh, with uh, a set of ideas um, and programs how to improve you know, the humankind and how to uh, bring bright, a brighter future. Imagine Nazism and communism both dreamed of a brighter future for, for the humankind. Uh, they differed in the method. I mean, they differed in the uh, they they were actually very similar in the methods, you know, by extinguishing groups of people. That's what, what was their their way of uh, towards a brighter future. But uh, what they differed in, uh, in was uh, what kind of uh, groups of people they wanted to exterminate. Like the Nazism wanted to exterminate Jews and uh, and uh, uh, like uh, different minorities. Uh, people with disabilities, uh, essentially all people, people that did not fit the uh, criterion of, uh, you know, of the pure race of, of Aryans. The communists wanted to exterminate another uh, group of people, uh, what we now call middle class, what we now call um, even upper classes uh, of society, of the society. They wanted to uh, to free the space, so to say, for you know, for the lower classes to, to do, dominate. That's what they, that's what, how they defined the what they called uh, the dictatorship of the proletarians. So uh, they uh, were similar in uh, in their aspiration for a better future for the, for for the humankind. They were similar in their methods, meaning extermination of groups of people, and uh, they differed in the way how they identified what kind what kind of people uh, they wanted to exterminate, uh, and they also in, um, uh, shared in. Uh, in the way how they treated religion. Uh, well, communism uh, was, as we know, very much in, against any religion. It's, uh, it was a militant atheism that it pro- professed. Um, it envisaged a communist ideology, envisaged a future for the humankind free, for, free of any religion. That was the dream. Uh, and as for Nazism, it didn't like religion either, but it certainly uh, used this idea that, well, communists want to exterminate religion, we want to protect it somehow. But this sort of protection of religion was uh, rather an instrumentalization of religion. They actually wanted religion to serve them, to serve the Nazi ideology. That's why they organized you know, groups of Christians and they tried to uh, persuade groups of Christians as, uh, like in the countries like Germany uh, to... Uh, consolidate themselves around the Nazi ideology. That's how they group uh, formed the groups like Deutsche Christen, the, the German Christians, which was essentially a kind of quasi church, almost a church, but it was essentially more like a political party uh, supporting the Nazi ideology. So that is kind of uh, the, the 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 frame in which political religion emerged. And both groups, they, uh, I mean Nazis and communists, they uh, try to. Uh, consolidate masses. They try to persuade masses to believe them, to subscribe to their ideas, to their ideologies by um, uh, offering some kind of rights, some kind of you know quasi-religious motivation for the people. Uh, they functioned, they acted as as churches, as religions per se. Imagine communism being like a sort of religion. Uh, 
even though communism was against any religion, but it replaced religion and played a role of a religion. The same was with Nazism. Nazism, for those who believed in Nazism, was a sort of religion. Yes, they could be Christians, in a sense. You know, uh, Now, we can, of course, we can question what kind of Christians they were, but they professed themselves as Christians, at least. And at the same time, they believed in Nazism as a sort of another religion. Uh, so this is basically the idea of, of, uh, of political religion. Um, it functions as uh, a quasi-church, as a religion, but it serves political purposes and it primarily uh, supports an ideology. Um, uh, also, the feature of political religion is that it is coercive. Uh, this makes it a political religion different from the civil religion. Civil religion is a sort of... Uh, uh, slightly different, well, quite fundamentally different, I would say, even though it appears to be slightly different from political religion, because civil religion also um, in, uh, implies some kind of cults, uh, civic cults, uh, when people come together and they do, well, they perform some rites together. Uh, like the best example of that is American civil religion. It has been described, you know, by prominent sociologists uh, um, uh, as a, a distant phenomenon. So when people, you know, uh, demonstrate their allegiance to the American flag. They participate, you know, in the uh, in the procession. They sing together. Uh, they um, uh, do together things that constitute essentially sort of a system of rights of American civil religion. Um, and also the idea of the civil religion is to, to preserve the cohesions, the, the, the cohesion, the kind of coherence of the people uh, to unite them around an idea. Well, in this case, in the case of the American civil religion, it's the idea of freedom. Uh, that's what, what people like feel being united for. Uh, so one may ask the question, what is the difference then between the civil religion and political religion? I believe that the main difference is that civil religion is uh, voluntarily. It's, uh, it requ requires the consent of the people, while political religion is, is violent and it's coercive. So essentially, it's like uh, the difference like between you know, the TV uh, commercials, like they encourage you to buy things right on TV uh, in the case of the civil religion, but they don't force you to buy things. Essentially, the idea of the civil religion is to encourage you to subscribe to the ideas of the civil religion without forcing you to do that. The political religion is different. It's when you are forced, you know, you don't have other choice but to buy this product uh, uh, or to subscribe to a particular ideology and to follow a particular line. That is the basic kind of difference. So now with, when, when it comes to Ukraine and Russia, I think we can, one can explain the relationship between Ukraine and Russia also in the terms of civil and political religion. In Russia, after the fall of communism, uh, there was a kind of political uh, and ideological void, emptiness. Uh, when the communist ideology was gone and the Russian people didn't have anything to believe in, essentially. Uh, so what uh, the church came up with was a sort of civil religion. Uh, which would combine, you know, the elements of the uh, of the Orthodox Christianity, uh, also of the, you know, kind of communist ideology, very kind of watered down, uh, and some ideas from the pre-communist era, from the imperial era of the Russian Empire, Romanov's Empire. So that was a very strange mix of, of ideas, and originally uh, this ideology functioned as a, as a civil religion, so no one was forced to subscribe. Uh, to it, no one was to believe in it, but it was kind of offered as a substitute for the communist ideology. But very soon, um, this civil religion uh, changed into a, to, into a more violent form, the form of political religion. I believe this happened like in 2012. You probably remember this episode with uh, a Pussy Riot uh, punk band, uh, a, a female uh, band that performed in a church in Moscow in 2012. And for that performance, they were punished, you know, with imprisonment, uh, with the support of the church. The church actually endorsed this kind of sentence to that, to that group. Um, and uh, I think that's when the uh, transformation of the Russian civil religion happened to the, uh, to the political religion. And since then, now for 10 years, it has been evolving as a political religion and reached its ultimate, the most violent uh, kind of apotheosis uh, peak in this war in Ukraine. So what we are dealing with in, in Ukraine, I believe, is essentially a form of a very violent political religion of sorts that existed in Europe in the interwar period in the forms of Nazism and fascism. 
Thank you for that. There's a lot there, and I, I want to try to unpack a little bit of it for some people who these might be new ideas. So, and, and kind of like the, the broadest strokes outline, and, and I got this from your book as well, Political Orthodoxies, which I would really recommend to people, is that kind of after the, the, Soviet, the fall of the USSR, there's, there's this vacuum, kind of a, a propaganda or even a exactly. ideological vacuum. And then the Orthodox Church comes to inhabit that vacuum with this new first civil religion and then what becomes a political religion. Right. And so I, I think that that's a helpful kind of way of framing the history there and understanding mm -hmm. maybe what kind of in some sense motivates Rus Russian culture, of course, at a very broad general level. But could you help me make that connection a little more to what's going on in Ukraine there? Because I think for a lot of my viewers um, who maybe aren't as familiar with the dynamics of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine mm -hmm. and in Russia, they might say, well, why would that inspire kind of this invasion of Ukraine, aren't they also Orthodox? Yeah. Is it to unite yeah. the Orthodox Church? Is it because the Orthodox churches are separate there? Could, could you kind of drill into that a bit to help yeah. people understand that? Yeah, yeah. Also, this is a very good question. Uh, and uh, it is needed to be answered, to be to understand better what is going on indeed. Well, uh, from the perspective of the political religion that emerged in Russia, uh, this religion presented the global kind of scene in the terms of uh, of Russia being a distinct civilization uh, and um, being imposed upon or intruded by the West. Uh, so from this perspective, the West appears to be like a unified force. So to say, well, of course, those who live in the West cannot imagine the West being unified around well, actually, many things. It seems to be really divided and 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 fragmented. But but from the perspective of Russia, the West uh, uh, comes up as a unified front, uh, uh, and its purpose is the only one to conquer Russia. Uh, I believe that this is essentially a projection of Russia's own kind of desires and and fears uh, of conquering, and it is like a sort of projection of Russia. Uh, upon the West, uh, essentially people like Putin uh, think of the West in terms of their own political culture, of their own political thinking. They, they perceive themselves as conquerors and they are afraid that because the West is, more, is stronger, is more powerful, uh, it, will, it wants to uh, you know, take over Russia. And essentially for, from the Russian perspective, what is happening in Ukraine is not an, an aggression, it is a protection, it is defense quite paradoxically. Uh, so they see themselves as defending themselves against a completely imagined enemy. Essentially, yes, we should say that their enemy is a completely, it exists only in their own heads. It doesn't exist in reality. And still it, they fight it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I would, I would call this enemy, there is a, a, a French phrase, a French word, la tarasque. Latarask is like a monster, you know, the, those monsters that ch children imagine when they are alone in the darkness in their room, and they imagine those monsters coming to them. And of course, we know those monsters don't exist, but for the, for the children, they do exist. Uh, and uh, or like in this movie, Monster Academy, that's exactly a sort of things that Putin lives in. The world of Putin is the world of those monsters. It is a very childish world, certainly. Uh, that's why, well, he is not a mature person, personality, as a personality. And he still lives in the world of, of monsters, imagined monsters, and, and he, he fights those monsters. So essentially, yes, um, uh, this uh, political religion that we are talking about in Russia features uh, uh, this perception of the world, where there is, you know, this holy Russia surrounded by the monsters, you know, from the dark room in the child's imagination. And they try to fight those monsters. For them, Ukraine is occupied by those monsters uh, temporarily. And essentially, they want to liberate Ukraine from, uh, from those monsters. Uh, uh, that's how they think about things, like dream about things. But in reality, what they do, they just kill people. It's very plain. Just imagine, you know, a, a, a paranoid and insane person uh, fighting, you know, those imagined monsters in a room. Uh, in his imagination, he is fighting monsters, but in effect, he's just destroying everything around him. And that's the reality. Um, yes. And 
to perceive, I believe, to perceive the world in these terms, you know, holy ruse against the monsters. One has to have a very insane imagination and at the same time an imagination affected by religion. And my uh, argument would be that uh, this is not a healthy religion that they practice, not a healthy metaphysics they are driven by, but it is an unhealthy metaphysics. This, this is a distortion of religion. This is a distortion of the tradition they pretend to profess and to protect. And that's why I believe uh, their distorted perception of religion, of the world, needs to be addressed from the perspective of healthy religion, not just from the perspective of secularism, not just, you know, say to say, OK, get rid of this religion. It kills people again. No, it, it will not work. Uh, what will work is to try to correct this worldview, unhealthy, insane worldview from the perspective of healthy religion. That's what we try to do with my colleagues by deconstructing, you know, Putinism as a sort of deviation of Christianity. And we try to do it from the perspective of our own tradition. I believe it, it provides us with a lot of resources, healthy resources to deconstruct this monster, uh, which is uh, Putin's religion and Putin's worldview. I'm fascinated by that idea of deconstructing Putinism. And I think you're absolutely right that the... And you didn't say this, but uh, you're right that secularism isn't the answer. And I think the reflex in the West is to look at the way in which orthodoxy has maybe been weaponized or politicized <coughs> by Putin and think, well, okay, that's the answer. If we can just kind of replace that with maybe a more secular enlightenment worldview, everything will be great. But that seems to fundamentally misunderstand exactly. this idea of, yeah, of what Putin believes about the world because that's exactly what they're fighting against, right? Or at least perceived exactly. fighting against. It's exactly. It will just add add uh, oil to fire if you if you try to deal with it uh, with Putinism in this way. Yes, and, and that's why I'm so excited to ha have you on to to talk about this. As you know, there's there's many ways and many angles at which you could talk about this conflict, and, and many of them are fruitful. But I, I think being able to address the kind of religious implications, especially as someone with a background in ecclesiology, is just so important here. I, I want to maybe just give a second to, to hone in on that idea you were talking about. You, when you were talking about Holy Mother Russia against the world, it, it seemed to me to be pretty closely parallel to what seems to be a more technical term that you bring up in your work uh, called the Russian world and how do we interpret yeah. the Russian world and ultimately it seems that one of the goals is to show that that ideology of the Russian world is essentially bankrupt or it doesn't align with yeah. reality. Yeah. Now in an article that you wrote on interpreting the Russian world and I believe at this time you were talking about the conflict in Crimea, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. You, yeah. you write exactly. the conflict in Ukraine is a is indeed a civil conflict, but not between the people of the Ukrainian state as the Russian propaganda presents it, but between the people who fall under the formal criteria of the, quote, Russian world, and yet they fight and kill each other. One side does so in the name of the Russian world, while the other side, because they refuse to identify themselves with the Russian world. This proves that the Russian world is an imaginary community shaped by an ideology that divides people and inspires them to kill each other. To stop the fighting in eastern Ukraine, I would imagine we would say now in all of Ukraine, and to reconcile yeah. the divided people of the country, the concept of the Russian world should be dismantled. Could you walk us through this a bit? Because I, I think yeah. some people, th they might identify with that idea of, okay, fighting monsters, this isn't helpful. But but specifically the Russian world, it seems to get into maybe another even deeper idea. But I'll, I'll, I'll let you talk about how that's important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. It's also another good uh, side of the question that needs to be explained indeed. Yeah, um, uh, can, you can uh, uh, describe the political religion that we, are, we were talking about in different ways. Uh, and the Russians themselves, they don't describe uh, this political religion as a political religion. They describe it as the Russian world uh, idea. Uh, that is their term. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that is the concept which has been developed and actually named in this way uh, by the uh, primate of the Russian church, Patrick Kirill himself, who is kind of the, the proponent of the ideology, the, the main proponent, I would argue. And um, uh, the concept of the Russian world is quite complex. Uh, it features, it includes a lot of elements in a very kind of uh, somehow chaotic 
systematic way, I would say. Um, so you can see there, you can discern there the elements of the political religion that I mentioned. You can discern there uh, a sort of metaphysics that I already mentioned that can be, you know, uh, observed in Putin's mind. Uh, it also features <clears throat> uh, some elements of the Western culture wars. If you take the American situation, the culture wars in the United States between the, you know, Republicans and Democrats, and uh, you know the those who the the, the, the choicers and and the uh, um, uh, the pro life movement, uh, or, or people who are in support of LGBT uh, community, people who are strongly against it. Those culture wars, they are also a part of the Russian world ideology. They have become a part of the uh, of this ideology. Um, and uh, I usually, you know, I usually explain to my students that the culture wars are neither about culture nor about war. Uh, but in the case of Ukraine and Russia, uh, a culture war has become a real war. Uh, it, it, it came very close to become a real war in the United States with the events a year ago on 6th of January when the you know the the, the crowds tried to uh, to uh, to storm the capital. Uh, that was another kind of instance, I believe, of uh, of a culture war um, in, on the American on, on the American soil. But this element of the culture was in the agenda of the Russian world makes it attractive to many people outside the Russian world. That's why a lot of kind of people in different conservative groups in the in the United States, uh, religious groups like the white evangelicals, not all of them, but some of them, quite a considerable number of them, or, you know, conservative Catholics or Pentecostals would subscribe uh, to Putin's agenda, even would support him. And they, they certainly, many of them, openly supported Putin, well, at least before the war. Hopefully they will stop doing this uh, after the war, in the wake of the war. Uh, but I mean, uh, this uh, aspect culture of the culture wars uh, makes the uh, purely Russian um, kind of thing, project, a geopolitical project, attractive to many people beyond the Russian world. And now... <clears throat> It, uh, it also alienates people within the Russian Orthodox community or the Orthodox community. Indeed, as, I, as you quoted correctly uh, my piece, and I still argue for that, um, most people who fight on both sides in the war, even now, they are Orthodox Christians. If they have any religion, it's the Orthodox Christianity, right? And imagine people kill each other, um, uh, even though in the past, that it might be that they, you know, participated in communion together in the same congregation, the same communi community. Uh, they would have approached the same chalice, and now they kill each other. And the question is why? They are not different in, in religion. They are not different in, you know, in in the way how they see God. Uh, why then they kill each other? And my answer to this is because a part of this religion of uh, Orthodox Christianity has been indeed infected. Uh, intoxicated by the ideology of the Russian world. Essentially, that is the component that adds to religion, that makes this a part, a part of this religion, or a part of the people who subscribe to this religion, uh, alienated to other parts of, uh, of the people. And uh, that's, uh, that indicates exactly how toxic can be the ideologization of religion. I call it politicization of religion. You may call it the uh, a, a kind of, well the, the other way around. Sometimes I say uh, we are speaking about the ideology ideologization of theology. We can also talk about theologization of ideology when ideology, as a purely secular construct of ideology, uh, gets uh, bested, uh, gets you know dressed in theological terms, in theological language. Uh, both uh, kind of phenomena they are approximately the same, and they are they are dangerous. That's why another kind of thing that I suggest as a proposal to, you know, disarm the ideology of the Russian world is to de-theologize ideology or to de-ideologize theology. That is my project of Putin and deputinization of the Russian church and Russian society, which I think is needed. And it's, it can be like a solution, a key to uh, how to deal with the situation after the war. Because after the war, we need to, you know, we need to do something about the reasons that had led to the war in the first place. And I think it is important at the stage after the war to uh, proceed to a very systematic, thorough, thoughtful uh, deputinization of the Russian social and religious life. I wanna kind of double click on that idea of deputinizing. 
uh, the Russian religious life. I, I'm all for it, and it, it seems so important. And you highlight that idea of people who could commune at, at the same chalice now killing each other. And, and what, what does that? It has to be that there's something above this, right? Because the, the religion yeah. should be uniting them, but there has been this politicization that Indeed. has um, been so potent to, to allow something like this. What does it look like to begin to deputinize um, Orthodox Christianity in Russia? H how would one go about doing that? I know it's not an easy project, but I know it's something you're committed to. So w what does that look like? Yes, it has started already, and uh, we are working on this with uh, some colleagues of mine. Uh, probably you've, uh, you, are, you may be aware about the declaration uh, that denounced the Russian world ideology was uh, drafted by some prominent Orthodox theologians and signed uh, by a, a considerable number of other theologians. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, this project presupposes, first of all, we need to really analyze uh, the Russian world ideology, and we really, really, really need to separate what is theological in this ideology and what is ideological, what is political. Uh, and this is a very intellectual kind of effort. We need to be to do uh, intellectual work, pretty much, um, uh, of uh, distinguishing between the political and theological elements in the ideology, and then certainly we need to uh, um, uh, to deconstruct. I mean, not just to distinguish intellectually, but actually almost physically, to separate the elements uh, of, of theology and ideology from each other. Uh, we need to articulate clearly um, what, is, um, what is wrong about this ideology from the perspective of, of the orthodox theology, of the orthodox tradition, and uh, maybe even to condemn the wrong element in political theology, in political theology of, uh, of the Russian world. Uh, this suggestion has been done by the theologians, and they really want to proceed to, you know, to very radical steps of condemning a new heresy uh, of the Russian world. They, they render the Russian world as a heresy, and they argue that, and this is also my argument, that the Russian world is essentially a continuation of the old heresy, which had been condemned as, as early as in 1872 at the Council in Constantinople. It was condemned as an, uh, known as tribalism. In Greek, they call it philetism. Uh, so it's tribalism. It's, it's essentially the idea that if you belong to a tribe, right, and uh, you believe that uh, this tribe has a special mission from God, then you can do whatever you want. You, you are exempted, you know, from you know, from laws, from from rules uh, and, and things. And then what, 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 what kind of the other thing is how you define your tribe. You can define your tribe as a nation, like ethnos, and uh, that's how we go to nationalism, and that's why nationalism is something which has to be rejected from, well, at least from the perspective of my tradition. Uh, also, you can go as uh, as far as to identify a tribe with a civilization. That's exactly what Putin does. Uh, he defines his own tribe in the terms of, you know, of a global Russian civilization. That is his name for, you know, for the Russian world. Uh, it's nothing more than uh, just another extended form of tribalism. And uh, this is wrong, and this needs to be condemned on the premises that already existed our, in our tradition. So that's another kind of way to, to deal with this uh, in, in terms of deconstructing the uh, Russian world ideology. I don't know if this gets too far afield, but when you bring up that idea of philatism, it's something that I know has been a hot issue in the comment sections of my videos at times. I've got a very diverse audience of <coughs> Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants. And, and one concern that a lot of non-Orthodox seem to have with the Orthodox Church is, is this very idea that the... So on the one hand, philatism has been condemned as heresy. Uh, and What was that, 1872 at Constantinople, you said? That's uh, correct. On the other hand, I think for a lot of outsiders looking in, they say, it seems like the Orthodox Church in at least the modern world has been built around national churches, which seems to lead yeah. to this idea. I wonder how yeah. maybe we can distinguish those two ideas, or, or maybe yeah. they don't need to be distinguished. Maybe you think both are bad. I, I'm not sure. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah. Because I could hear some people saying, well, for instance, if I walk down the street here in Chicago, I can walk right past an OCA church, which is 
loosely yeah. affiliated with America and Russia, I suppose. And then maybe two blocks from it is a Greek Orthodox church, and you know maybe uh, not too far. Of course, we have a, a Ukrainian village in Chicago. A yes, we do. Ukrainian community. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I think some people would say, well, how do we distinguish those ideas? Because it seems like that the church has been built around these national identities. Could could you help me with that a little bit there? Absolutely, yes. Uh, there, there should be a very clear differenti differentiation between the healthy national identity and unhealthy national identity. Just like with theology, there is a healthy theology, unhealthy he theology. Um, uh, on the one hand, we uh, speak about patriotism as a healthy phenomenon. Patriotism is essentially when you respect your own identity, when you respect your own nation, which is absolutely fine because, well, uh, it feeds the you know, God's plan about humankind. That's why we, we are human beings are, are separated to those ethnic groups after all. Uh, and it's not without reason. Uh, so one thing is when you respect uh, your own identity, but you also respect other uh, ethnic identities and, and groups. That is about patriotism. It's not about hatred. It's about respect. And it's about, you know, receiving others uh, as your partners, as your uh, counterparts. Uh, and another thing is nationalism. Essentially, nationalism is, is different because nationalism is about, about exempting yourself among others. When you respect your identity to the extent that you begin to reject the identity of others. When you endorse your own identity uh, at the expense of, uh, of degrading the identity of others. Um, uh, I, I think, well, I doubt that uh, at that time, President Trump, when he said that he's a nationalist, he really understood the definition of nationalism. But probably he was right when he declared himself a national, because that sort of nationalism was exactly what I described. It, it was at, at, at the expense of others, you know, uh, made, uh, make America great again by degrading uh, or diminishing others. That is exactly the nature of nationalism. And this is something that needs to be condemned uh, from, you know, from the religious perspective. Um, so to summarize, patriotism is good. It's good to be patriot. It's good to be respecting your identity. It's good, but as far as you respect other identities as well, the moment you stop respecting others and, uh, you know, uh, exaggerate your own, what you are, as as an uh, uh, you know a nation, <clears throat> at that moment, it turns into a very health uh, into a very unhealthy and to a very dangerous I think uh, thing uh, that may lead to the situation that we have in Ukraine now because exactly that is the point of the Russian world. They say we are unique because we are orthodox. <clears throat> we hold the truth without any compromise. Uh, we hold <clears throat> we stand for the traditional values. Well, the values of the family, you know, Christian morality. Others, like the West, they have uh, fallen. Uh, they have compromised those values, Christian values, even if they are Orthodox, <clears throat> like in Ukraine, because they align with the ideas of, you know, of democracy, of, uh, uh, of freedom. Uh, for the Russians, it's a compromise of their faith. That's why they are inferior to us. That's why we are eligible to fight them and even to kill them. That is essentially the driving force of the of this war. It stems from exactly the sort of nationalism, exceptionism that the Russians have. Thank you for that. I think that's going to be broadly applicable for people and very helpful, whether they're thinking about philatism in the Orthodox Church, whether they're thinking <clears throat> about the conflict in Ukraine and Russia, or they're just reflecting on some of the major conversations that have been going on in the West, generally speaking. Or in between, the United States. I yeah. think it is very applicable to the American situation. It, it, it certainly is of this, this line that we're trying to distinguish between, which I think is oh so important, between you're allowed to love your country. That That's not what people are saying when we're condemning nationalism. And being able to, to make that distinction in such a way that doesn't feel threatening to so many people because I having entered into these conversations with people or having watched these conversations happen often in the least productive ways, right, and on Facebook comment sections or wherever, you, you see people feeling that when they hear that nationalism is bad, which I fully agree with, um, they feel as though people are telling them that that means they can't love their country. But, but I think it gets to that idea of exceptionalism there, which is so important and so dangerous. As we see, when, when you have that sense of the religious and the moral high ground, you can begin to justify so many things 
and it becomes very, very dangerous, as we are seeing in uh, just gruesome fact fashion. I want to shift here just a little bit to this idea of occidentalism, which you talk about in some of your work, which has, I think, been in the background of what we've been talking about throughout this conversation with this idea of the boogie monster West kind of trying to infringe upon the East there. But I, I, I want to, and maybe I say that with too much jest there, because I want to be sensitive to the fact that I do have people that are attracted to this idea, as you've said, and be able to kind of show with, with reason and, and theological care why this isn't helpful. Um, whether these people come from Russia, I recognize I have a global audience, but also, like you said, kind of conservative Christians can be allured by this idea of this holy Russia that's trying to remain pure. And I, I think that begins to be consolidated in this idea of occidentalism, of the holy East, and maybe that gets shrunk all the way down to Russia versus the godless, pagan, secular West. Now, this seems to also have not only kind of secular overtones of they believe in democracy and freedom and that's going to hurt our religion, but also seems to be something that runs very deep in the Orthodox Church of seeing, yeah. uh, maybe at its worst, in, in fairness, I don't want to say, you know, at its best it has this, but seeing everything that is Western being bad, even to its most extreme of like someone like Augustine, someone who might be considered a church father because he's exactly. Western, exactly. is now, you know, kind of automatically bad. Talk to me about this That's idea. That's why, for example, yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, That's ahead. exactly why those who are opposing the West in the East, even, you know, brilliant theologians, really bright people, uh, they, for example, believe that Augustine is the reason of all Western evils. They even believe, you know, that uh, Augustine is to be blamed for Western secularism. So it's really kind of impossible to uh, to, to kind of to, to accept from the historical perspective. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a very good question again. And uh, indeed, uh, this East-West divide, which is a completely constructed, uh, imagined thing, it's not a reality, <clears throat> it's an imagination, it's another tar la tarask, another monster uh, that comes out of one, one's mind, um, is underpinned by a, a very specific religious worldview. Uh, in the past, <clears throat> in the history of Christianity, this worldview has been identified as, as Gnostic, as Manichaean, because, because it was pertinent, it was um, uh, adopted by the groups uh, of Gnostics and Manichaeans, and they saw the world in, exactly in black and white, in, and has divided into two parts. One part is, you know, intrinsically, ontologically, essentially uh, good, and another part as ontologically, essentially bad, regardless of what they do. They are destined, you know, to be good and bad. Um, it's it's um, a very ancient kind of uh, world uh, way of, of seeing the world. Uh, it's not Christian. Uh, Christianity tried to overcome this worldview uh, through uh, the patristic writings, you know, some brilliant theologians, like especially like Irenaeus of Lyon, for example, a, a great theologian of the past. Uh, he very successfully rebuked this kind of worldview, and he argued that the entire world is the creation of creation of God. The world is good. Uh, you cannot say, if you say that a part of this world is intrinsically, essentially bad, you don't believe in God, essentially, in the, in the, in the omnipotence of God, uh, you doubt God, essentially, that God is able to create, you know, an entirely good thing, entirely good world. So, essentially, <clears throat> uh, uh, the agnostic uh, worldview is... Uh, is a result of weak faith, I believe, uh, as a result of a perception of the world that sees the world as, uh, or sees the God as not capable enough, not powerful enough to create an entirely good world. And they believe that the parts of the world have been affected by evil so deeply that it, they need to be either destroyed or, you know, rebuilt from the scratch. Um, essentially, this worldview underpins the Russian perception of, I mean, Putin, Putin's and his confederates' um, a perception of the world. They see the world in black and white. They see the world, uh, they see Russia as intrinsically good, and see, they see the West, especially the United States, as the incarnation of the cosmic evil. Uh, one can <clears throat> uh, uh, be reminded in this point, you know, of the, uh, of the perception how, like, uh, radical Muslims uh, who back, you know, Daesh, the uh, Islamic State, and 
Marx and, and things like that uh, see the world. They see the world in exactly the same terms, in black and white. And for them, you know, the United States is like a global global shaitan, demonic, uh, you know, um, uh, force in the world, and uh, which needs to be eliminated. That's why they come and uh, you know and blast and uh, um, um, uh, you know to twin towers and uh, do all these uh, terroristic uh, attacks uh, on the United States. Uh, they are underpinned by the same dualistic Manichaean worldview that Russian, uh, the, the Russian peasant has. And um, uh, essentially, the way how to deal with this, I, I believe, it's again not by rejecting religion as such, but I, uh, by imposing, you know, an orthodox with a small O, you know, not just the identity thing, but the kind of orthodox way of seeing things. Uh, and the orthodox way of Christianity is exactly to see the world as it is, as a good thing, as the creation of God, as uh, uh, not as divided into black and white parts of it. Uh, also, I want to say that <clears throat> uh, this dualistic worldview is is very easy intellectually to uh, to practice. If you want, it's a sort of conspiracy theory. Uh, we know that conspiracy theories, they are very easy to conceive and to, you know, and to believe in. That's why they are so popular, because they don't require much effort, intellectual effort. Uh, so basically, the, this conspiracy theory says, you see, we are kind of Russians. We are good people here. And the rest of the world, primarily the United States, conspire against us. They want to destroy us. And they do whatever, you know, we can imagine or maybe we don't even imagine what they try to do to us. And uh, they firmly believe that there is a huge, you know, anti-Russian conspiracy in the world. And they essentially try to protect themselves. It's paranoic. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's intellectually kind of very weak, as any conspiracy the theory is weak. But that's the reality. That's what they believe. So they, they essentially, they have a very deficient worldview. Uh, they are driven by fear. They are driven by those imagined monsters that they produce themselves, imagine themselves, and uh, they are desperate to fight them. As, and, and as a result, we have this war in Ukraine. Hmm. Yes, thank you for that. I, I think that's going to be helpful for people, even if it might strike a nerve with some people, which often the things that strike a nerve are helpful. Because I, I think my channel has tended to attract a lot of people who uh, maybe grew up evangelical and became Orthodox or Catholic, and I think specifically for a lot of those that became Orthodox, part of taking on that Orthodox identity was becoming anti-Western, right? Defining oneself by what they are not anymore, at least in their own perception of, hey, I used to be this evangelical Protestant, but then I realized that Western theology is bad and Eastern theology is good. And now I, I want to be fair yeah, and say that for wrong, many of them they're more is, nuanced but yeah, yeah. i think for a lot of people that is what happens um and i think it is good to uh, to answer to this question i mean to address this issue because <clears throat> i believe this is a wrong perception of orthodoxy if they came to orthodoxy for those reasons it's kind of a wrong uh, destination because orthodoxy is not about you know west east divide orthodoxy well it was born in the time when there was a global roman empire and when there was no divide between East and West. And orthodoxy actually was formed, the orthodox theology was formed as free of this East-West divide. It came, came uh, to the orthodox church much later, and uh, it is essentially, intrinsically, a dualistic perception of, uh, of the church. I think it is a kind of um, uh, the remnant uh, of the agnostic legacy in Christianity, and this legacy is not healthy. That's why I think, uh, regardless of the war, regardless of what we are talking about, Russia, you know, uh, it's important in the Orthodox Church, within the Orthodox Church, as it is important within the Catholic Church or evangelical churches, I think to, uh, uh, to chase out this idea of, you know, easy answers to, you know, complicated questions, uh, to chase out the idea of uh, the, this dualism, uh, the conspiracy theories, uh, this kind of re really intellectually very weak uh, 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 polarization, dichotomization between, you know, us good and them bad, us, you know, orthodox Easterners against them, heretical Westerners. 
this is kind of a wrong, I would say, take on orthodoxy. And the people who want to be really mature in their Christianity, they certainly need to overcome this kind of uh, worldview and perception. Yes, I think that is such a needed thing. And I understand how it happens. Like you said, these are these are easy answers and kind of like a sound bite culture. <clears throat> these these work right for apologetics. You know, they have those short term gains of giving people this model that seems very easy, but then doesn't actually hold up with reality. And ultimately, exactly. I don't think is helpful. And I think, you know, it, it's worth saying as we talk about those dualisms that, at least from my perspective, and I, I imagine you would agree, but that when we talk about this conflict as well, we, we want to be careful to distinguish maybe between Putin and, and his kind of confederates and the, the people that are guiding that Russian world ideology and people who are simply living in Russia and very well may not support this war at all. I, I don't sure. want to paint with, with too broad of a brush to say that everyone living within the geographical bounds of Russia believes the exact things we've talked about and, and wants to exactly. support this in this way. And so I think I think that's important. Yeah, that, and that, that would be another easy kind of uh, answer to the complicated question. The easy answer would be, well, all those Russians are, you know, are bad and, you know, uh, uh, they they want their killers, murderers and, and, and so forth. No, it's it's not true. That is a very easy uh, uh, and almost another conspiracy theory, if you want. Now against Russians, uh, painting all of them in the same uh, in the same uh, hume in the same colors. Uh, no, there are, I, I know Russians who uh, are very strongly against you know the war, and uh, uh, they have uh, you know sane attitude to what Putin is doing. They are very much anti-Putin. Uh, the same I would say about the pe many people in the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, whom I know, and they are against the war, against what uh, even the leadership of the church is doing. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, I should say that probably the majority are either passively or actively supporting Putin in Russia. That's another very sad truth. But not all of them, still. And that we need to be careful to distinguish be between those who are for Putin, for this war, and those who are against. Yes, th thank you for that. <clears throat> Maybe this is my evangelicalism talking, maybe it's my Western pragmatism or my generational activism. I don't know. But I always like to try to end my interviews by giving people a concrete next step they can take to maybe try to move things slightly in a better direction. And I want to give you the opportunity to speak directly maybe to my Orthodox uh, followers who can maybe most directly participate in what you talk about of this de-idealization de yeah. of theology or the de-theologization of ideology. What can people going away from this interview do to help maybe move the Orthodox Church in, in the smallest of ways in a direction that, that helps prevent conflicts like these from happening again? Yeah. Absolutely. So, well, I believe uh, we in the Eastern Christian traditions are, in fact, uh, in fact, quite well prepared to deal with this sort of, uh, you know, issues. Because uh, in our history, we had everything, both good and bad things. You know, we had uh, uh, a complete affiliation with the Roman Empire to the extent that we completely, you know, aligned ourselves with the imperial agendas and, and projects. <clears throat> Uh, but before that, we had an amazing history of non-conformism and uh, counterculturalism, in the sense that the, well, we with, withstood um, uh, the, the pressure of the pagan Roman Empire. Christians learned how to live without being affected by politics, which was very unusual for the, you know, for the Greek or Roman world, because <clears throat> it was even of the Greek or Roman world that religion and, and politics were intertwined. They were unthinkable, uh, separate, uh, uh, you know, to be separate from each other. Uh, religion, politics, usually, it was the rule, <clears throat> constituted one thing. And only Christianity, when Christianity came to this world, Jesus Christ, when came, he <clears throat> uh, made this revolution. I, I, I would call it the revolution of non-conformism, when Jesus Christ essentially introduced the idea that religion can be, uh, you know, stand separately from politics can be separated from politi politics. And since then, we I think we have had this ideal. So I believe that it is crucial for uh, for Christians, regardless whether it is Orthodox Christian or Evangelical or Catholic, Catholic Christians, to remember 
uh, this kind of Jesus' revolution uh, against the, the, uh, the uh, basic principles of the Greek and Roman world, against this principle, cuius um, regio eius religio, whoever rules, that, that person dictates the religion. Uh, which is imposed upon, upon the subjects. So Jesus essentially said, no, it's up to you, up to uh, your personal choice, what kind of re religion you want. And uh, that choice has the ultimate value in the eyes of God. Because if you choose, you choose your religion. That is your choice. And that choice has the value for God. And uh, um, uh, that choice has not to be conditioned conditioned by culture wars, by political agendas, ideologies. Uh, it's deeply inside human soul, human mind, that the choice has to be made, not uh, in the line, you know, in any pol in the line with any politics or any ideology. That would be kind of my uh, my uh, conclusion, if you want, which I think could be relevant for all, uh, you know, confessions and Christian groups. Wonderful, thank you. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that this isn't the first time and uh, regrettably most likely will not be the last time that Christians marry religion and politics. And I think um, I absolutely agree that that is the the ideal and the Christian faith there. Um, but, but for skeptical outsiders looking in who want to point back at history of the many times this has happened, I want to say, yeah, I, I own that. that. That As Christians, we have not always gotten this right. Um, but by God's exactly. grace, hopefully... We, we can do better. Well, well Dr. Havaran, thank you so much for your time today. This has been an absolute uh, privilege for me, and I think this will really bless people. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to close, as I always do on this channel, by asking four questions that kind of help people get to know the guest on um, maybe a little more personal level, as the conversations on this channel can tend to be very heady and intellectual, and this certainly had a lot of depth. And I, I don't mean to bring these on to uh, bring undue levity to a serious conversation, but I, I um, think people would appreciate to get to hear these things. So the first question is, what has been the most fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? Well, um, I would say uh, uh, the most, well, a very important thing uh, of my kind of religious practice, if you, if you want, has been Jesus' prayer which is very important in, in Eastern Christianity when we repeat the name of Jesus. I think it is kind of, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very important thing, uh, I believe. And it can be practiced by anyone, by any Christian, as a matter of fact. It's not just, you know, for the Orthodox. And it's very easy to practice. It's the easiest prayer that one can imagine. And it's very helpful. Yes, I love that. I read The Way of the Pilgrim, I believe, a year or so ago. And exactly. really yeah. opened my eyes to that. So yeah. I, I love it. Yeah. Um, outside the Bible, what has been the most impactful book on your life? Uh, yeah, it's also a good question. Uh, actually, I would not identify a single book. Uh, the Bible is the most important book, certainly. Uh, through the Bible, I came to faith. You know, I I read you know pieces of the gospel in uh, you know in the time when the gospel was not available as a book in the Soviet in the late Soviet era, and by reading you know excerpts from the gospel which were published in a you know scientific magazine, imagine uh, how it happened in the Soviet Union. Uh, that's uh, how I converted eventually. Uh, but other texts, uh, well, I be I believe yes, what we call the fathers of the church. The patristic literature, then it has been the most important uh, source after the Bible for me. Very well. That that sounds like a fascinating conversion story. I'd love to hear that one day. Uh, you're having coffee with your undergrad or early grad school self. What's one piece of advice you give him for his future in theology? Um, Yes, uh, because I teach uh, to different uh, students in different contexts, uh, like in the United, United States, in Europe, even in China, in Asia. Uh, it depends where, with whom I have this conversation, certainly. Uh, um, I would certainly advise people uh, to use their rationality to, uh, to analyze, you know, to check their faith. Uh, I like this saying, you know, it's very simple, uh, maybe even simplistic, uh, that you need to in, in, engage both your mind and your heart in your, in your faith, in your theology. Um, so the mind in theology without heart leads you to, leads you to a heresy. The heart without mind 
leads you to wrong spiritual feelings. So one has to probably avoid both extremes and to, to put together heart and mind. Wonderful. And the final question that I ask all of my guests is uh, it, it revolves around the fact that my channel is called Gospel Simplicity, yet the conversations can often become very complex, leading people to ask if I'll ever change the name to Gospel Complexity, which I answer with a resounding never. But in a sentence or so, what is the gospel? Yes, uh, I like your the title of your um, of your program, uh, Gospel Simplicity. I think it is. While well, gospel is about simplicity, I believe God is very simple, and that is a theological maxim. You know, God is simple. God is not complex, and uh, this applies also to our life. Christian belief, I believe, is 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 about simplicity. About, it's about humbleness, and uh, gospel is, if you want, is the ultimate. Uh, expression, manifestation of humbleness, of, of the divine humbleness. Wonderful. Dr. Havaran, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a privilege. Thank, everyone, or thank you to everyone who watches this sometime in the future. I appreciate your time as well. Um, but Dr. Havaran, uh, really, I, I know this is such a, a heavy and pressing and personal topic, so thank you so, so much. Um, thank all, you. Yes. All the uh, best. May God bless you and your audience. Yes. God bless.